Hello, good morning, and welcome to today's Golda Enberg Lecture, uh, celebrating Social Work Month. And um, I am very honored to introduce today's speakers. Um, first, we have uh, Makia Kamara, who is a social worker who works at the Action for Boston Community Development, where she manages a civic engagement program for older adults. After 10 years working with adolescents and youth in congregate care, she shifted to the field of aging where, with a focus on intergenerational spaces, ageism, and digital equality. Nicole Ivoni is a, a, an equal opportunity specialist with the New Hampshire National Guard, where she facilitates cultural competence training and evaluates the health and welfare of the organizational culture. She is a trauma yoga therapist north of Boston. She is a member of her town school's district uh, equality committee and is committed to social justice in the spaces she occupies. And Ashley Davis is a clinical associate professor at the Boston University School of Social Work, where she teaches courses on clinical practice and social work research. She maintains a private practice in Arlington and for 11 years, she worked as a social worker at McLean Care, primarily in the social work flow pool. Their presentation today is titled Addressing Microaggressions in Mental Health Care, Increasing Social Workers' Awareness and Skills. Thank you all so much for joining us today and have a wonderful Grand Rounds. Okay, welcome everyone, um, or okay to start, I assume, correct? Um, my name is Nicole Ivoni, and I'm really glad to be in this space. I'm going to start off with you. Um, again, thank you for being here, and we'll get going. Um, so we are going to be talking about addressing microaggressions in the mental health care, um, increasing social work awareness and skills. Traumatic events have been a stark reminder that racism bias still exists in this country. The tragic deaths of Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Aubrey, George Floyd, amongst others, has placed a spotlight on 450 plus years of systemic bias, inequalities, social justice, and the treatment of minorities. The attack on the Capitol shocked the nation, and we were reminded by the recent events of the long history of discrimination against Asian Americans. Sadly, since the start of COVID-19, harassment, violence has only increased. The current pandemic has highlighted the racial disparities in healthcare and longstanding systemic health and social inequities have put many people from racial and ethnic minority groups at increased risk of getting sick and dying from COVID-19. As social workers, we are continuously striving for greater diversity, equity, inclusion, policy change and social justice. It can be difficult for many to relate to the oppression minorities face on a daily basis. However, we can empathize, listen, support, and find moments of self-awareness and self-reflection, -reflect excuse me, to be better. We're not immune to bias or racism, but we must be vigilant in recognizing it and taking steps to end it. Researchers have indicated that in many cases, bias and discrimination go unchallenged because the behaviors and words are disguised in ways that provide cover for their expression and or their belief that they are harmless and in insignificant. There needs to be an emphasis centered around the importance that we shift the power structure created by white supremacy. That we intentionally, especially as white people, shift that dynamic of the power with instead of that power over. Be aware of our language, our actions, and the decisions we make with and potential for our clients. Our systems are embedded in white supremacy and we cannot change the structures within and bring about equity if we do not understand how these systems are upheld. Very often we avoid discussions around racism because it's uncomfortable. We often avoid these moments and comments that make us feel that some sort of way, you know, that icky gut feeling you get when someone says something but you can't quite name it, just because we don't know how to name it. Race relations are profoundly complex, but we must be willing to continue to have these tough conversations. And we must be willing to stop walking by the problem. Start craving people holding you acceptable and setting boundaries if you don't already do so. But how do we create safe spaces to do this? Where do we start? We know that we must shift from a non-racist identity 
to an action-oriented approach. But the reality is, reality is, which I'm sure a lot of you can relate, is that most educational and training programs fall really short of teaching allies, especially white allies, concrete and direct strategies to influence perpetrators and social systems. As we move through these next slides, we encourage you to reflect on your own experiences. When emotions arise, as you reflect on these certain statements, I've had a client tell me about a personal experience of racism. I speak up when family or friends make a racist comment. I speak up when I noticed racism in the workplace. I can recognize when I've committed a microaggression. I welcome feedback when I have committed a microaggression. I would really encourage you to write these down. Uh, journal, that's one of the techniques we always give our clients to do. I would encourage you to journal these as you go through and use them into later experiences. Go back to these statements and use it as a constant reflection. Sit with any discomfort if you have it, if you had some discomfort when I read those questions. Try to identify where you are in the context of race. Remember where you are is okay. Know that when you know better, you do better. This work is really complicated, it's messy, and at times it's uncomfortable, but that's all part of the process. Understand that you did not create this mess and know that, as, that we as social workers have a personal and professional responsibility to correct it. As Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, we will have to repent in this generation, not merely for the hateful words and actions of the bad people, but the appalling silence of the good people. We will now take a deep dive into disarming racial microaggressions and provide opportunities to you, for you to reflect individually and collaborate together, together. Ashley will start off with defining microaggressions and provide some context in disarming microaggressions. We will have an opportunity to engage in vignettes and encourage participation. As we move through this presentation, feel free to ask questions in your chat. We'll track questions, save them for the end, most likely, and potentially answer with our Q&A session. On to you, Ashley. Thank you. So let's start by defining some of the terms that we're using. The term microaggressions was originally coined by uh, psychiatrist Dr. Chester Pierce, um, local here to the Boston area. Um, who coined the term related um, to uh, microaggressions against um, black people, saying that they are subtle, stunning, often automatic and nonverbal exchanges that are put downs of blacks by offenders. The uh, concept was expanded by um, Dr. Darrell Wing Sue, who um, described microaggressions as those brief and commonplace daily verbal, behavioral, or environmental indignities, whether intentional or unintentional, that communicate hostile, derogatory, or negative slights and insults to members of oppressed groups. And then to bring it into a social work context and use our social work lens to think about microaggressions, um, social worker, um, Dr. Farrell Ross Sharif um, offers this working definition. Um, saying that microaggressions are communications perpetrated by individuals or organizations that convey disrespect to target individuals or groups. And they may be overt or subtle, and they convey uh, hostility and the hurtful effect um, may be intentional or unintentional. They can be a one-off or part of a pattern. And the effect of microaggressions um, is important to recognize because um, it is often to marginally reduce the confidence, the self-esteem or the effectiveness of target persons. So let's get concrete with some examples of what it is we're talking about. Um, perhaps some of these um, examples are familiar to you. Um, we could think about two mental health specialists who are both black. Um, being routinely confused by clinical staff or by patients um, who call them by the wrong name. Uh, an intake form that lists racial categories but are not inclusive or require patients to just select one. Um, a unit manager who brushes off complaints about microaggressions that are brought to their attention. A patient who's been assigned a doctor who is of South Asian descent and the patient tells his social worker that he would feel more comfortable with an American doctor. 
Um, and at a staff meeting following the killing of George Floyd, if there were no impact, uh, no mention of this injustice and the possible impact on patients, providers, or the larger community. So you can see that microaggressions can be a whole range of things and certainly other examples as well. Um, it's important to recognize that there is not um, complete agreement about the term microaggressions. Um, you may be familiar with the book, um, how, to, how to Be an Anti-Racist um, by Dr. Ibram X. Kendi, who is the director of the Center for Anti-Racist Research at Boston University. Um, and he takes issue with the term um, microaggressions, um, saying that um, he detests the post-racial platform that uh, supported its su sudden popularity, um, and that the components don't really accurately get at um, what is happening here. Um, the term uh, micro is that racist abuse is not a minor act, um, and that abuse describes um, the actions and its effect on people, um, distress, anger, worry, depression, anxiety, pain, fatigue, suicide. So it's important to really um, uh, understand the gravity of what we're talking about, even though um, the word microaggression um, can uh, appear to refer to something much, um, much smaller. It's good too to put this in the context of systemic oppression, um, that while we might be talking about things that largely happen on an individual or an interpersonal level, um, that these are all part of the same system of oppression and that sometimes what is happening on an individual or interpersonal level is simply reflecting um, the larger unequal system of power and privilege um, that often gets played out in structural and institutional contexts. So um, these are all mutually reinforcing um, and making um, white supremacy culture um, invisible and therefore hard to name and hard to um, hard to challenge. So today we are focusing on racial microaggressions, um, really centering um, race as our as a social identity of um, of interest um, to us. Um, but it's important to recognize that people are, um, you know, very multifaceted in their identities, and that race is is just one social identity um, of many. Um, and legal scholar Kimberly Crenshaw. Um, uh, introduce the term of um, an intersectional analysis um, in which we look at the ways that we occupy multiple social identities and that for some people um, having um, locating themselves in uh, multiple identities that um, um, are, are marginalized um, may give them even less access to sources of power and privilege. Um, and so these are complicated and nuanced um, and really contextual um, understandings of oppression. Um, so while we are focusing on a single axis um, in our talk today, um, the, the larger context of how these um, aspects work together is important. So microaggressions um, in uh, Dr. Sue's work um, have been uh, described in terms of three different types. Um, micro assaults are probably pretty obvious to recognize. These tend to be um, the explicit um, acts of racism, whether verbal, nonverbal, or environmental, that are really intended to hurt um, the victim through things like name calling, um, avoidant behavior, and purposeful uh, discriminatory actions. I think we would all um, be able to say that's racism when we see something um, that's a uh, micro assault. Micro insults and micro invalidations are a little harder to recognize and that's part of what makes them so um, insidious and so tricky. Um, a micro insult are the communications that convey rudeness and insensitivity um, and demean a person's racial heritage or identity. And micro invalidations um, are communications that exclude, negate or nullify the psychological thoughts, feelings and experiential reality of a person. Um, so because these are more subtle and often not intentional, um, they can be harder to recognize and name and therefore harder to address. And why do people commit microaggressions? Um, there are certainly many different um, thoughts about this. Um, some might say they're just acts of rudeness, thoughtlessness, or bad manners, um, which doesn't really get at the piece that um, uh, talks about how they also reflect the biases that we hold. 
They might be chalked up to insensitivity or misunderstanding or a person's ignorance. We're leaning towards these last two points here and how we're thinking about microaggressions, that they are ways of reflecting the bias and the stereotypes that exist in the larger culture. Um, Dr. Uh, Beverly Daniel Tatum talks about it as the smog in the air that we all breathe. And that if we are living in um, a culture in which um, racism and white supremacy is all around us, then we can't help but um, internalize um, some of that and it can lead to microaggressions. Um, as well as um, looking at the ways that white people are socialized into Eurocentric values, beliefs, standards, and norms, um, which can make uh, the perception of their power, of our power and privilege normative and therefore invisible. And so um, calling this um, out in the open is an important piece um, in understanding why microaggressions persist. In healthcare settings, um, we can also look at the ways that there can be aversive racism. So those people in positions of power, um, whether due to their professional role or their social identities or some combination of the two, um, may deny holding biases and prejudice, especially if they have strong convictions about social and racial justice. Like how could I do this if I also hold these values and ethics um, so central to my identity? And so that can lead to um, microaggressions. Um, it also can reflect organizational practices that inadequately respond to discrimination and microaggressions. Um, that can lead to um, uh, perpetuating these uh, within the workplace. Um, we do know, um, research has shown us that satisfaction with healthcare services um, has been found to correlate with health outcomes and that this association is mediated by the patient provider relationship. Um, and so it's important to think about in, in healthcare settings um, that microaggressions can undermine um, patient-centered care um, by threatening the opportunity to have a positive relationship. But the effects on individuals from targeted groups um, are important to understand um, because they're quite serious. Um, and uh, research has shown that, um, that chronic exposure to discrimination can produce a stress response um, that can lead to um, premature aging um, and health concerns. Um, racism is a social determinant of health. Um, and so looking at increased morbidity and mortality rates um, among um, racial minority groups. You can look at the mental health issues that can result um, from experiences of racism, um, traumatic stress, depression, anxiety, and so forth. Um, and then uh, conceptualizing the ways that microaggressions can produce psychological distress, sap our spiritual energy, seriously impair relationships, and foster inequities for people of color. Um, as a white person who looks at the issue of white privilege, I will also say that um, microaggressions and racism have uh, a negative effect on white people, not to the same degree by any stretch that um, people of color are affected, but the ideas of um, internalized dominance and um, unearned power and privilege um, have a negative effect on the mental health um, of white people as well. So the insidiousness of microaggressions, I think is one of the things that can make it so hard. Um, these are moments where somebody is left with lots of questions and second guessing things and trying to figure out what the intent behind um, what has happened or what is happening, um, what, it, what it means. You know, what just happened? Am I interpreting it correctly? What did they really mean? Am I making a big deal out of nothing? Um, should I let it go? Will speaking up make it worse? That sort of second guessing and questioning oneself, often um, uh, missing the moment to respond or carrying those questions um, you know, long after a moment has passed. Um, and that for many people who are the target of racial microaggressions, that pain can be um, heightened by um, isolation of not being able to share the experience um, with uh, white people, whether they're um, friends or colleagues. Um, because of the fear of being dismissed or having it rationalized or minimized, um, that, you know, that happens to me too, or that's not really a big deal, or, I, you know, those sorts of ways of um, dismissing what's happened really are further microaggressions if we're, um, we're going to uh, um, look at what that interaction is like. 
Um, so this is a, a diagram of thinking about three social positions that we might um, come from in thinking about microaggressions. Uh, and these are not fixed positions. We're not always the um, victim. We're not always the bystander. We're not always the perpetrator. It's possible that depending on the focus of the microaggression, depending on the context, the situation, we might actually find ourselves occupying each of these roles um, at different times. Um, and some um, uh, kind of guidelines for how one might think about responding depending on what position we are in um, could be if we are the target of a microaggression, um, we need to remember that our first uh, responsibility is to um, ourselves, um, that we can pause and consider um, the range of possible actions we can take. And then finding ways that ultimately will reclaim um, the person's voice is important. Um, microaggressions can be very silencing and um, finding some way, whether that's with um, uh, a trusted friend or colleague, um, a therapist, um, uh, members of one's own community, finding ways to reclaim one's, one's voice um, can be a, an important part of that process and may lead to um, speaking up and addressing the microaggression um, as well. Witnesses, sometimes called bystanders, um, active bystanders, upstanders, um, can be uh, can really have an important role here. And this might be a role that we, um, as social workers, often find ourselves in. Um, so these can be um, times that we need to really consider um, not what would I lose by speaking up, but what would I lose by not acting if I don't address what I'm seeing and what's happening. Um, clarifying our goals for the interaction. Um, am I trying to um, empathize with the target of the microaggression? Am I trying to um, um, you know, bring this to the attention of somebody who's perpetrated a microaggression? Am I trying to educate that person? What, what is my goal in this moment? Um, grounding our actions in care. I care about my um, professional role. I care about this organization. I care about um, the person who's been targeted. Um, and so therefore I feel um, compelled to do something. And then the times that we um, find ourselves in the perpetrator role and realize that we've, we've um, in, you know, acted on the biases that we hold, um, these are opportunities for us to look into rather than away from oppressive patterns, um, thinking about accountability as a process, not as a procedure. Um, sometimes when uh, Makia and Nicole and I are talking about this, people will say like, well, just tell me what to do. Tell me what the right answer is and how to address this. Um, and that there really isn't, you know, a simple checklist of do these things. It's not a procedure. It's an ongoing process of learning to be accountable and how to respond. Um, and then seeking either restorative action or even transformative action. How do I make things right again? Or how do I make things better so this doesn't happen again? Um, and finally, before I pass things off to Makia, because um, we're gonna look at a few vignettes next and have um, a bit of a chance to consider some of the ways that one might um, uh, intervene in um, times where we've um, engaged in a microaggression, had one directed at us or have witnessed one. Um, this is a real opportunity for social workers to think about um, advancing racial justice as enacting our professional values. We're a values-based profession. And so thinking about social justice, competence, the dignity and worth of the individual among other values um, is really central and can, can help ground us in what, what do I think I should do next um, in this situation. And then remembering that um, we often talk about the you know, micro, meso and macro levels um, of practice, we can think about intervening on different levels too, directly with a perpetrator at an institutional level or at a societal level. And some of Sue's work has come up with kind of four categories of micro interventions. Um, we can think about um, uh, making the invisible visible um, as, one, as one approach. So this might be an opportunity um, to ask for clarification, um, to try to make those things that are not explicit more explicit. Um, uh, those meta communications where we just want to clarify what's happening. We can disarm the microaggression. So this is a, um, an opportunity to counter um, act the effects. Um, we can express disagreement. We can find ways to have a voice and be heard. Um, maybe this would involve things like protesting or lobbying for policy change or serving on a board, ways that our voice can be heard to make a difference and counteract what's happened. 
Um, we can uh, educate the offender, maybe even pointing out how they benefit from these systems of oppression um, and educate more broadly. So this could be advocating for trainings um, and other, um, uh, other approaches to try to learn more and um, heighten one's awareness and one's skill set. Um, and then seeking external intervention, um, always important. Um, this can include things like um, uh, reporting things to a supervisor, finding allies and supporters, um, tapping into one's professional network, um, seeking a support group, um, and remembering that we don't go at this alone. Um, oppression is gonna, there's a role for all of us in addressing oppression. And depending on what the situation is, bringing in people who um, uh, can support us in that work and can offer resources and some guidance um, can be really important. So, Nakia. So, like Ashley said, we're going to get into the interactive portion um, of today. Uh, as Nicole said earlier, feel free to drop any comments and questions in the QA um, in the chat, and we will definitely try to get through to them as we go through each vignette. We definitely encourage that so that we can talk about it together along the way. We also encourage people to interact with each other. Um, you know, there is a lot of knowledge here, I'm sure, even though I can't, you know, can't see everyone. Um, but, you know, it'd be great for people to share their own experiences. Something I do want to know is that this is a learning environment. We don't and won't know everything to ever exist about everything. Um, and it is our responsibility as social workers to continue to evolve with the world and continue to seek out that knowledge. And we also know that race can be a very difficult topic to talk about. So I do hope that people can truly, you know, listen and be open to taking feedback. Um, listen to people sharing their experiences and just feeling um, like this is a comfortable place that things can be said. Uh, we definitely want people to learn and walk away with something that they can continue to work on even as um, they go along in your professional and your personal life. So we have three vignettes. This first one is about Marissa. Um, we'll give you a bit of perspective based on these questions. And then for our, our next two ones, and also for this one, feel free to submit any comments uh, or questions. I'm sure um, being at McLean, there are multiple people in different roles and positions. So as we go through these vignettes, even though they are very specific, think about this from your own um, position and feel free to share those varied experiences. So you are meeting with Marissa, a 35-year-old Black woman, for a therapy session. Over the past year, she's been experiencing shortness of breath and intense back pain. The experience has led her to four urgent care visits and an ER trip. Her most recent visit was two days ago. Maria relays the following to you. I was suddenly feeling like I couldn't breathe, but I was afraid to go to the hospital because they never believed me. I finally decided to go to an urgent care. The nurse was rude and she was rough when she took my vitals. The doctor came in and asked what was going on. I started to talk, but he interrupted me to say, I can't give you meds. I explained that I didn't ask for meds and that I wanted to know what was wrong with me. I finished talking about my symptoms and he said, well, you don't look sick. I don't know what else to do to convince him. I didn't know what else to do to convince him that something was wrong with me. I know my body and it just didn't feel right. So as we're thinking about those um, values that were just mentioned, think about as a social worker, what would the response be? Your personal response. And how could this reflect on a larger um, institutional and societal norms? Looking at your place of work, looking at your leadership, looking at your own network outside of work, and just how that reflects how people think about certain situations. As a black social worker, I can say that I've had a very similar experience to this. As someone who's worked with children um, and youth and adolescents and teenagers, I can also say that I've witnessed this type of thing within social work, within other helping professions. 
And one of the things that comes out of it is that it's very isolating. As a social worker, it does become confusing because we recognize these values. I'm sure everyone has had that social work syllabus that has every competency listed and the values and everything on it. However, it becomes confusing when you don't see those things in action based on specific responses. So as a social worker, how do you operationalize social justice, competency, dignity, and worth of the person? In experiences I've had personally and seen from others, the response has been denial, questioning, doubt. Microaggressions are everyday assaults. Sometimes by the time a person gets to you and explains this to you, this is what's going on with them, it means that things have piled up pretty high. And as a social worker or a therapist, that therapeutic support, you don't want to add to that pile. So for me personally, things that have helped is first asking the question, what do you think is going on? Not making that assumption, because not every Black person coming in is going to give this type of story and say it's because I'm a Black woman. They may have other things that they're talking about. So definitely seeking their response. Also, for me, what was helpful is not asking other questions based on details of what happened, like what were you wearing? Or how many doctors did you see? Or um, just other things that may be going on that don't get to the bigger conversation of feeling that my race and gender has caused this type of reaction. Other things that help is obviously validation. I hear you. I can see that this is having an effect on you. It has had an effect on you. Sometimes people are looking for feedback and sometimes people aren't. Seeking and asking that out first before offering specific um, types of things um, is definitely important to do ahead of time. One of the things that I definitely encountered was, well, you should report it. You should definitely report it. You should find somebody, you should make a complaint. However, if you're repeating that or you know, relaying that from a place of privilege, you have to think about, okay, if I make this complaint, then there may be a different response versus a black woman who has told you she's gone through all of these experiences. And then as a social worker, you don't stop at just a session, right? Social workers, regardless of if you're just clinical, we know that we address the full range from micro to macro. And so how are you taking this outside of your session? It doesn't specifically have to be Marissa, right? Confidentiality, all that. But thinking about this situation of how a Black woman may be treated in the healthcare system, in the social work field, what are your peers talking about? Is this talked about in your you know, workspace? Is this something your supervisors talk about? Are these conversations only coming from people of color? Are people listening to other people of color? Does your organization have people of color? Are people relying on that emotional labor to be on people of color? Looking throughout your organization, your agency, if you're in a hospital, throughout the hospital, where is leadership on with talking about these issues? Over the past year, a lot of places have released these anti-oppression, anti-racist statements and how they're dedicated. How is that operationalized? And if you are in um, these positions where you have power and privilege, how do you leverage that? In terms of you know, leadership or supervisor, director, and even if you're not, what privilege identity do you have that can help support pushing this along. So we would love to get some comments and questions and just feedback in the second, um, in the you know, Q&A box for this second vignette. So we talk about social work students. At a teaching hospital, five MSW students are welcomed into the training program each year. The social work supervisors interview potential interns, and then discuss the qualifications of each applicant. The pool of potential interns was very strong and the group of supervisors was having a hard time narrowing down their top choices. 
in a discussion, a Latino student, one social work said, uh, in a discussion about a Latino student, one social worker said, he impressed me, so articulate. My only concern is with his professionalism. He might not fit in with the culture here. So again, thinking about the social work values, how can you connect that to the way that you respond? How might other social workers respond? And then thinking about your larger institutional, or your larger um, institutional and society norms, what does that look like? Something also would be great to hear, what is professionalism? How do you define that? What is culture? What does that mean? Fitting in with culture, if you've heard that before, what does that mean? And we can, you know, wait for a few seconds to get some responses. So good question. Why the comment of articulate? So Jeffrey, I hope I pronounced that correctly. I would like, I would want to follow up and clarify what, what the social worker meant by professionalism and fitting in with the culture. Could you clarify for me what our culture is here? How do those relate in this context? And I do want to attempt to say your name, and I'm sorry if I say it incorrectly. Midelki, Judy, not directly answering the questions, but I've been in groups discussing potential applicants or recruits and found that people feel uncomfortable even naming the different races, like wanting to not focus on race. I've, I've definitely had that experience where, like you said, naming the different races, even saying, you know, the word black or, um, Chinese American or anything that's specific, like you said, people feel uncomfortable and kind of shy away from that. So Charles, our culture is strong enough to expand to include people with personal styles that don't we don't already have here. I'm guessing that's what you would say your response is. Why might he not, not might not fit or not open enough to other ways of relating? And this is a good one. And I'm wondering if anyone has any thoughts or um, kind of like a, a list or anything of what is professionalism? Keith asked, how did professionalism get assessed? So what does professionalism mean? What does that look like? Um, you often see it on job descriptions, but how exactly is that a term that's okay to be used? Is it something that we need to get rid of? What are your thoughts on that? Caleb, I worry if there is a culture, people will automatically feel not a part of it or outside in some way. And Julie, if someone doesn't fit into our culture, doesn't that mean we would not be accessible to all the clients we want to? That seems to indicate we need to take steps or to expand our culture. And that's very important. And then how does that reflect on when you look around the people that are working? How does that reflect? Um, if that reflects the people that you're serving? So if you are in a city and you have a predominantly white social work staff, but your people you're working with are predominantly people of color, but this cultural fit is something that you all are striving for or that gets used a lot, then how is that, what's the disconnect? And how do you address that? me to advance to the next vignette, Magia? Yeah. 
And if you, you know, continue to have comments or questions or anything about, you know, the second one or the first one, you can continue to add those in the comments. So for vignette number three, a discharge meeting was held to review um, the aftercare plans. The patient, a 30 year old Chinese American woman, did not have an existing treatment team. She was hesitant to accept the recommendation of outpatient therapy. With encouragement from the social worker, she agreed to try and requested to be referred to a female therapist of Asian descent. In reviewing the aftercare plan, the social worker stated, I tried to find an Asian therapist but that's like a needle in a haystack. The only one I know isn't taking any new clients. So I've arranged for you to meet with Ms. Jones instead. She's very nice, warm, and really treats everyone the same. So in addition to thinking about values and larger institutional norms, how might um, the patient respond? Um, if your meeting included other clinicians, how might they or you intervene? What I also know is that, um, you know, with my own identity and professional experience, like someone said earlier, access is a huge issue. If there is a culture that doesn't bring on people who don't fit into whatever this culture is, and that just so happens to be uh, professionals of color, and then it makes it a lot harder for you to serve communities, whole communities. And so in this situation, what do you feel like is under your control? What do you feel like is out of your control? Are your hands tied? What else can you do? In addition, and for any of the vignettes, what do you not know? What do you think are your limitations? So Julie, refraining from complaining about the difficulty of the search to the client. Asking colleagues for therapist recommendations. And so something to think about is your colleagues, are they, do they have that um, expertise or even experience with finding um, multicultural therapists or are connected to multicultural therapists? And like Christy say, this could cause a client to give up or make them feel helpless. Yes, the patient might feel like her feelings were invalidated by talking about access in that way. The social worker, social worker made it sound like her request was unreasonable. That's definitely a big one. I wouldn't do this in a group setting, Jeffrey, but as the clinician, I would clarify with patient that she, I would clarify with patient what she was hoping for with an Asian descent therapist. I think there may also be room to better understand the patient's perspective, definitely. And also look into the community, look into community resources, such as the Chinese American Cultural Society. And that's great because there are a lot of mental health resources. And if you are just looking in networks that, again, are not multicultural or you would not get um, that type of referral, then it's not really doing, um, doing the client justice. If you really can't find anyone and can only suggest someone who doesn't fit her request, at least acknowledge the request and express that you're sorry you couldn't find one and encourage her to give this one a try while someone keeps looking.
Okay, just to, anybody has a few more comments or questions, um, and then we'll transition to general questions or questions about anything and experiences. I could express that there is difficulty or may take time, but also ask client if they prefer someone in the interim or waiting. That's a great approach. Perhaps the provider can ask why the patient requested someone with agent descent to get more detailed information. Yeah, so these really do get at, um, you know, this point of not making it feel like this client is kind of in, out in left field for asking, for making this request. Um, and also validating and seeking more information. Maybe the provider could explore what qualities of treatment from a female therapist, a therapist um, of Asian descent that the client is looking for. Bring to your superior to work um, at work, the need for resources and changes in how we collect resources, absolutely. And that's taking it you know, outside of the session and starting to expand it um, into these bigger realms. Treats everyone the same is equivalent to, I don't see color exactly. That's definitely something that we hope that people picked up on it also makes an assumption of what the client is looking for in, with an Asian um, descent therapist. It invalidates the post person's cultural identity and experience. Exactly. Should I go on to the next slide? To um, we are. Um, okay. Yes, we can. Just have two final slides to. Um, to wrap this up and then we're happy to hear more general questions and comments too. Um, I think it's important to think about this as ongoing work for us as providers. Um, that when we think about our patient provider relationships, um, we can reduce and repair microaggressions when we um, are attuned to them, when we have this on um, our radar as, as important ongoing, intentional, reflective and process oriented um, uh, practices that are all part of the work. Um, and that consciousness raising um, is an opportunity to more deeply empathize with our clients' lived experiences um, and under, understand the oppressive nature of institutions against people of color. Um, often we can talk about that in a historical sense, but it's really important to look at the ways that this is ongoing um, and currently happening as well. Um, I think many of the disparities that um, uh, became apparent during the time of COVID and even in the vaccine rollout may, might point to some of these um, you know, really current issues. Um, and in acknowledging our power um, uh, as a provider, perhaps because of um, uh, some of our social identities, um, perhaps other reasons as well. Um, and then thinking about ways that we can use that power and privilege, um, ways that we can leverage it in, in our work with our clients and on behalf of our clients. Um, and finally, uh, just to, to summarize some of the things that social workers can do, because I think taking action um, is important for us to conceptualize broadly. There's no one, one right way to um, act with or on behalf of our clients. Um, so certainly um, checking our biases and learning more, um, taking action and being an upstander when we notice things that seem off, being that voice who can um, wonder about something or not collude with something that isn't sitting right with us. Um, and supporting our clients with a more systemic and anti-oppressive lens, um, looking beyond the individual or interpersonal interactions and thinking about how this um, is reflective of the larger um, racism and white supremacy within um, the society in which we are located and doing our work. Um, we provided a resource sheet um, and a handout um, to Marjorie that she will be emailing um, out with some additional resources and thoughts um, uh, that may be of interest, podcasts and videos and articles and, um, and so on. So I hope that that um, can help continue the conversation beyond this. Um, and uh, as you move on from this talk today, we hope that you all think about um, you know, what, what new idea you might have gained, where you still have questions, um, and ways that you could 
um, incorporate being an upstander um, more intentionally in your work when you witness um, uh, microaggressions. So thank you all. We're happy to um, engage directly with questions or comments at this point. Thank you all three for a really uh, great uh, stimulating presentation. Um, we already have some questions coming in. Um, the first one, you know, it kind of makes the observation that some people are brusque, haughty, or rude just by their nature. And, um, and sometimes the victim of a microaggression might actually engage a behavior where they deserve um, to be, uh, you know, um, to receive critical feedback, such as maybe they're derelict in their duty or they did a poor job. How does one distinguish between race-based aggression and the non-race-based course interactions between people that are often common. Stated otherwise, can't a recipient of aggression be deserving of uh, criticism? So something um, to point out is when you go back to the definition, what microaggressions are, um, microaggressions are based in racism, which feeds into this bigger system of white supremacy. And so when we think about whether someone is deserving of a microaggression, you think, as we're talking today, we're talking about racial microaggressions. When you're thinking about it as, you know, is someone deserving of that? You are, you know, it's also kind of sending that message of, is someone deserving of a racist response or interaction? What's also true is that certain groups of people um, are perceived in certain ways in terms of their behavior and how they interact. As a Black woman, there is that stereotype of the angry Black woman. And a lot of people react to Black women in that way. So if we are, I'll speak for myself, times where I have you know, been measured, have been misinterpreted to be angry or rude. And so you really have to think about, is your perspective based on a stereotype? Um, and we know that unconscious bias, these things can be built in and you may not even realize, but are you saying that this person is rude where maybe they're speaking loudly and there is no anger or anything behind that? Um, when it comes to people not doing their jobs and, you know, that gets into the competency, competency piece and um, even then, what is that perspective? So a lot of that, it is, you know, subjective and you do have to reflect on where are my feelings about this coming from and you know that's only something that you can do and you know for you to kind of do that work and start to build that self-awareness but when it comes to microaggressions it's never okay to you know give it or do it towards someone because it is based on racism with racial microaggressions just like with other types of microaggressions based on identity No, thank you. The, um, the next one is um, somewhat of a similar question. How do we determine what is a microaggression? For example, Cigna Healthcare recently issued a memo to its employees not to use terms such as boyfriend, girlfriend, mother, father, um, or even brown paper bag as it may be seen as a microaggression. I don't want to offend anyone, but it seems as though if you even ask why is this seen as offensive, you will automatically be labeled a microaggressor or worse. Are we becoming a culture that whomever is most offended gets to rule on what it is, what is or isn't acceptable language? So this guy, for me, when I hear this question, I think about the difference between intent and impact. And often we can think the intentions behind um, our language are neutral um, and yet how they're received can have an impact that's far from that. And I am not called to be perfect in my interactions in my language, but I do need to be accountable for how they are experienced by somebody I am, um, I am working with. And um, if I learn that the impact of my words um, has um, not sat right or not reflected the experience of the person I'm working with, um, there's an opportunity for me to learn and for there to be a repair and, um, and for that to be um, 
uh, all part of the all part of the experience, um, and perhaps even could be a more healing interaction to have the um, impact of what is said taken seriously and to use it as an opportunity to learn more. Yeah, yeah and I would add that these are opportunities to have these conversations. Um, we get into these, we have these assumptions or perceptions that it's a negative, but, but sometimes potential words might cause more harm. So having that communication interaction of what would be the best fit for the organization to reduce harm. I was think of mitigate risk and reduce that harm because again, that intent might not be to offend, but the impact it leaves on people, it's up to them how that feels and that impact as well. And I think that's important as Makia and Ashley have stated, to remove yourself from that situation. And also to, and obviously I don't know the context um, of this memo or where, you know, what else is said, but it makes me think of um, stuff around just like gender identity and how we, you know, sometimes you may talk to a child and assume that um, their parents are heterosexual and they're married. Um, and those are the things that don't recognize the varied experiences of people who are living um, out there. And I mean, it's also this builds into the competency, the social justice piece. It's a it's a hard um, it's hard, right? You're learning. You have to, you know, kind of seek these things out. You are unfortunately, you may say things that um, do harm, but the important piece is seeing this as a learning opportunity. Um, and if you are making those steps and taking taking those steps and really trying to do that work, then things will start to be understood. Um, it's not necessarily about, you know, most offended. It's really about how are we treating each other and how are we bringing people in, right? Somebody said with culture, if we're blocking people out, it's an accessibility issue. If you are not opening up your mind and trying to bring people into this circle, into this environment, the culture, then you're really, you know, causing more harm, even if that's not your intent. So unfortunately, I'm just mindful of the time and I want to respect everyone's time. It's one o'clock. So we're going to have to end. Um, but I really do want to give all of three of you a warm thank you uh, on behalf of McLean Hospital for sharing your expertise and all of your thoughts and your really stimulating discussion and perspective with us today. Thank you for having us. And we did include our emails here. Um, if anybody would like to continue the conversation or connect with us, um, we would certainly welcome that as well. Can I just uh, say really quickly um, the question that's in there? Yes. Um, and learning opportunity, learning process, takes a lot for people to kind of get there. Oh, yeah. 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 All right. Thank you all. And uh, okay. I hope you enjoy the rest of your days.